Welcome to Electrified, it's your host, Dylan Loomis. Before we begin, let's cover some basic terminology and acronyms, megabits per second and megabytes per second. Think of a bit like a light switch, with a value of either one or zero, it is the smallest form of computer data. A byte with a capital B is composed of eight bits. Thus, 16 bits would equal two bytes, capital B for bytes, lowercase b for bits, big letter, big unit. Generally speaking, bits are used to refer to interface speeds while bytes are used to refer to data storage or file size. So 100 megabits is roughly 12.5 megabytes. And for conversions, 100 megabits equals 0.1 gigabit, thus 1 gigabit equals 1000 megabits. Latency refers to how much time it takes for a signal to travel to its destination and back. Latency is measured in milliseconds, so the lower the latency number, the faster the communication. This is also referred to as ping. Some acronyms, RDOF, Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, FCC, Federal Communications Commission, ISP, Internet Service Provider, DOD, Department of Defense, LEO, Low Earth Orbit. Throughout the video, I will use miles since I live in the United States, but if you prefer kilometers, the conversion is one mile equals 1.6 kilometers. Interlink system, Simply put, the way satellites or sats communicate with one another via lasers or light communication. It's about 50% faster to send data packets in a vacuum in space in straight lines than via a fiber connection in the earth with geographic limitations. Specifically, about 300 meters per second in space compared to 204 meters per second bouncing through glass fiber optic cables. All right, let's begin with the latest news and the first potential IPO catalyst. I'm sure you've seen Elon's tweet by now and the takeaway, we need to see revenue growth being smooth and predictable before a Starlink IPO. This brings us to the RDOF. SpaceX is currently bidding on $20 billion of funds as the FCC plans to choose one or more telecom providers to expand rural customer access to gigabit speed internet service. It's not yet confirmed if SpaceX is competing in the fastest and most lucrative low latency tier, but 386 companies qualified to submit bids, only three of which are satellite broadband ISPs, Hughes, Viasat, and SpaceX. The bidding started Thursday, October 29th with rounds two, three, and four taking place Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, Hughes and Viasat use geostationary satellites at roughly 22,000 miles from the Earth, resulting in high lag times or latencies of up to 500 milliseconds or more versus the sub-100 millisecond times the FCC is looking for. SpaceX satellites are at altitudes of less than 400 miles from the Earth and are already showing latencies of around 30 milliseconds. Of the 386 companies qualified to submit bids, you probably recognize names like Verizon, Cox, and Altice. Now, in my humble opinion, companies like Verizon and Cox should not get one dime of taxpayer money. They have had decades of government sanctioned monopolies to expand their service areas, but they have chosen to bend over backwards in an attempt to stick to densely populated areas, neglecting the more sparse areas. They have had years to serve the rural folks and have failed. These are reverse auctions and there are two phases. Phase one will provide up to $16 billion and will target Get over 6 million homes and businesses that are entirely unserved with download speeds of at least 25 megabits per second. Phase 2 will then have a budget of $4.4 billion and will cover locations that are partially served as well as locations not funded by Phase 1. The RDOF will ensure the network stand the test of time by prioritizing higher network speeds and lower latency so those using the networks will be able to use future internet applications as well. As of now, there is not yet a set date for when the bidding will end. So winning a huge government contract could create a great environment to IPO Starlink, not only from a financial perspective, but from a public confidence perspective as well. These funds are expected to be deployed over 10 years, but winning the bid would go a very long way to generate buzz and confidence in Starlink for the average person who is not yet aware of the potential of Starlink. Speaking of that potential, the projections for Starlink when the network is more developed is to generate $30 billion in annual revenue with 60% profit margins. That would be $18 billion in expected annual profits. 
Now, it needs to be mentioned this has been attempted before. AT&T got several million dollars through the FCC's CAF2 program. Basically, they took the money and never really provided a working service. The way the FCC required reporting, a provider only needed to claim a single unit in a given census block can get service in order to claim the entire block was being served. Complaints were filed with the FCC, forwarded to AT&T, and then the FCC considered the matters closed after AT&T responded with a letter stating they were continually expanding service. Historically, satellites have sent data where they have been fixed over one spot in the sky, called geosynchronous orbit, at roughly 22,200 miles. Being so far away, the latency times have been around 700 milliseconds. Now, with SpaceX satellites about 340 miles in the sky, we are seeing much better latency speeds. These SpaceX satellites have to move faster to stay in orbit, so it's actually impossible for them to stay in one spot. Now, moving to the next catalyst, a working and reliable satellite interlink system. Just last month, we got confirmation that SpaceX revealed the first successful test of these space lasers in orbit, a big step in the path to their version two constellation which, by the way, is expected to be targeting 8 millisecond ping times and raising the bandwidth limit to a gigabit or more. This would be a huge deal for high frequency trading, which has billions of dollars at stake. And before anyone chimes in about security, laser interlinks are nearly unjammable and uninterceptable. Hence why the DoD is so interested in this and satellite interlinking is part of what makes the DoD Iridium's biggest customer. Now, of the roughly 900 satellites in LEO, about 650 of them are version 1, designed to serve limited customers. But I want to note, every roughly 5 years or so, these satellites will be deorbited and replaced to update the needs of the network. LEO sats will suffer from orbital decay, but in time and in different phases, Starlink will also have satellites higher up, but more on those in a future episode. Just know that periodically, the sats will be updated with newer versions from continuous replacement launches. But back to the biggest benefit of interlink, it's reduced latency or ping compared to a network without it. As mentioned, moving networking or data transfer into orbit, the data packets being transported requires much less routing to reach an end user, physically shortening the distance the data has to travel. These transfers are also occurring in a vacuum, increasing the speeds. With laser interlinks, connections being dropped would be much less likely. If an active satellite does not have a ground station in reach, it would then route those data packages by laser to a different satellite with immediate ground station access. With proper optimization, communications can be routed by laser to and from the ground stations that are physically closer to the user. Interlink network systems are also able to service a larger geographic area by allowing connections of users from ground stations to be routed through other satellites to the nearest ground station. This is a big deal because large-scale ground installations require laborious permitting processes which take up a ton of time and resources. Additionally, satellite-to-satellite -satellite interlinking is needed to serve roughly 80% or more of the Earth's surface. If you just rely on line-of-sight ground stations, you can at best serve roughly 20% of the world, and you would need hundreds of ground stations, each connected to an internet backbone, and each with specific agreements and rights in each country that hosts the ground station. Once again, serving as a limitation that is expensive and complex. With interlink technology, you have the potential to serve the planet pole to pole with data that can be routed in space to far fewer ground stations, enabling a more profitable military, government, shipping, crews, and aviation markets, providing more cost-effective service to remote areas. I do want to mention though, a functional LEO sat constellation does not intrinsically need interlink to function or be successful, as we've seen already with early beta testing, but the interlink offers some major benefits in return for the added spacecraft complexity and cost. But let's shift gears for a second and get back to some news. As we know, the better than nothing beta is live and becoming more impressive by the day. Even without widespread interlink, Starlink is providing better service than my cable provider as you're about to see. But first, looking at this chart, this is a list of confirmed locations that have been invited to use Starlink. 
So far, the known latitude range shows a low of 45.3 degrees and a high of 48.4. The known invite dates have started on October 26 and are continuing to today. But let's look at the performance. So here is my current internet, a test I ran yesterday. My ISP is Spectrum in Northwest PA and I use a Google Mesh Wi-Fi router in a normal, densely populated suburban area. I pay about $70 per month for my service and the router was $150. Here we have a screenshot of a Starlink beta user on Reddit from Raku2 with a faster megabit per second download speed, a faster upload speed, and a lower ping or latency of 30 milliseconds. Now we know that Starlink costs $499 for the equipment and about $99 per month, but as you can see, it's definitely already better than nothing and even better than my internet. And Elon just tweeted very early yesterday morning that latency will improve significantly soon, bandwidth too. That was in response to a tweet with a beta user speed test of 134 down, 14 up, and a 38 ping. And here are some images of the Starlink router from Pranay Patol on Twitter. Now yes, with satellite internet, we have weather and downtimes and obstructions and much else to consider, but we will save that for future episodes. However, real quick, Raku did share the terminals can detect when it's cold to heat themselves up in order to melt snow and ice. We will, of course, learn a lot more about the effectiveness of this in the coming winter months. Speaking of winter, I know you Canadians are anxiously awaiting approval to begin beta testing, but we do not yet have any confirmed timeline for approval. Stay patient, as with each passing week, the service will continue to get better. How much better is a great question. With the network mostly being unused right now with only limited beta testers, in theory, it would be tough to dramatically improve it while simultaneously having thousands of new users added to the network. However, if Starlink is currently routing all the traffic through a single internet exchange, there would be a lot of room for improvement by routing the traffic to an exchange that is closer to the user's location. SpaceX has actually told the FCC that current speeds and latency were based on if Starlink was under real life loads in response to some of their competitors complaining that Starlink wouldn't be able to deliver certain performance statistics and thus shouldn't be able to bid for subsidies. But when you consider things like software updates, new satellite launches, and other improvements, it's anyone's guess as to how much they can continue to improve bandwidth and latency from here. And just a quick tidbit, it takes about one month for the sats to climb from the altitude where they are released during launch, which is about 180 miles up, to get to their operating altitude of 340 miles. There are some processes happening in between, but the delay between launch and the beginning of commercial operation for each launch is roughly a month for at least some portion of each group of 60 sats. Now, with roughly 900 sats in LEO, they are still far from their initial network plans of 12,000 to provide steady, high-speed service to a larger area, which Elon has said would cost around $10 billion. Of course, Getting a portion of the RDOF funds would secure funding for the foreseeable future of operations and expansion. But they have even filed paperwork to eventually launch up to 42,000 sats. Currently, Starlink is being funded by SpaceX and they are making 6 sats per day and launching roughly 120 each month. The funding has been coming from NASA contracts and private funding. In August, SpaceX raised $1.9 billion from an undisclosed group of investors. Ector County also just became the first school district to use SpaceX satellites to provide internet for students. It will also provide free internet to 45 families in Odessa, Texas, with service to be active in early 2021. Now, I'm not arguing we see an IPO in the next 12 months by any stretch of the imagination. But as we know with Elon, expediting the process of Plan A, saving the planet with Tesla, and Plan B, having an insurance plan and escape route from Earth getting us to Mars, any option to accomplish these goals faster, and the latter in Elon's lifetime, would be an option he is likely to choose. There's still around 50% of the global population that does not have or use the internet. I would not be surprised if they were to win the RDOF funds and continue to see a high interest in early adoption over the next 12 months, 
that an IPO is considered sometime in 2022 or before. Starlink is a high margin, high revenue, simple subscription service that solves a massive problem with one of the most successful leaders on the planet. The public market interest is huge and I believe Elon has downplayed the potential valuation Starlink could achieve in the markets even right now. Companies like Nikola with zero sales had at times upwards of a $30 billion valuation so Starlink should have no problem generating a strong market cap. That said, Starlink will be used to fund Mars and if Elon wants to see that colonization happen in his lifetime, he knows every year matters. There is a right time for the Starlink IPO, and I think that time may be sooner than a few years. But that'll do it for this episode. Please take a moment to like the video if you learned something new. Consider subscribing for more Tesla, Elon, SpaceX, Starlink news, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Have a great day.